Good morning, everybody, and thank you for being here at the Governor's Mansion for our 2022 end of the year press conference. I apologize for last week when we had to suddenly reschedule. Uh, I think uh, I think you understand why we had to do uh, that, and I'll get into the tornadoes in just a moment. I, I want to start off by saying that by and large, this is an incredibly positive uh, year for our state. Uh, where we made a lot of progress in a number of areas, and I'll highlight some of those uh, in just a moment. And obviously, we continue to have uh, challenges as well, uh, as I think uh, you know, all states do, and, and, and certainly sometimes it seems like we have more than our fair share. Um, I do want to ask uh, everyone to keep the victims of last week's tornadoes in your prayer. You know, we were sort of uh, congratulating ourselves and, be, and very thankful, and rightfully so, that we had the best hurricane season in 31 years. Uh, and then last week, uh, we had at least 11 tornadoes uh, in 24 hours, literally in every corner of the state. Uh, three people were killed, uh, five people remain hospitalized, and many more are outside of their homes, which were damaged or destroyed to the point where they are just not habitable. All that 10 days before Christmas. And so let's keep these people in our thoughts and prayers, but more than that, let's see what we can do. And certainly we're doing that as a state, working with the Paris Offices of Emergency Preparedness. But I'm asking individuals to see what you can do uh, by donating. Uh, and, and each of the parishes that sustain damages have these efforts underway. Uh, and by the way, just, just in case you, you um, uh, don't know each of the parishes, they're Caddo, Union, Rapides, Iberia, St. Charles, Jefferson, Orleans, and St. Bernard. So if you're able, please consider donating to a local charity or contacting one of the impacted parishes about donation drop-off sites, what continues to be in need. Um, I want to start with some news. Uh, you may have seen it, I think, uh, about an hour ago. We issued a press release about Capitol Lakes, which is just right outside this building. Um, on this past Friday, I sent a letter to the EPA as the final step required to classify the long-polluted Capitol Lakes as a Superfund site. Uh, this makes it eligible for federal cleanup oversight uh, and funding. Uh, and that typically happens. Uh, with a 10% state match, 90% by the EPA. However, um, most often recently, and we think this will be the case, uh, the, the state match requirement uh, will likely be waived, but we'll be prepared to meet it should it not be waived. But just a little backstory on this. Um, pollution has been a problem at this lake since the early 1980s at least. Um, and the PCBs were do uh, detected back then, uh, and there were steps taken to try to encapsulate the contamination. You may know, and you, you can still see the signs are still posted. Uh, the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries uh, put up signs warning against the consumption of the fish. Those signs remain up. How however, uh, back in 2017, sampling by DEQ showed that the contamination was still present at unacceptable levels, um, and it wasn't encapsulated. It was actually in the water. Uh, and any option to rem remedy this problem is obviously a huge undertaking uh, that the state uh, just didn't and really still doesn't have the resources for. So we've been working with the EPA on the assessment uh, all the way through, and now we have the opportunity to breathe new life into the lakes, make them safe for wildlife and recreational use. It is going to take some time. Uh, these things don't happen immediately, but if you don't move forward, if you don't work with the EPA, if you don't get on the site, then it never would happen. And quite frankly, it's not a problem we should punt into the future. Uh, we know it's there. We need to take care of it now. And I think the end result is going to be a huge asset uh, to our capital region. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I said quite often during my, my campaign for re-election um, and had a hymn that, that uh, was sung at my inauguration uh, back in early uh, 2020 uh, was that God, God will order your steps. Uh, we have been taking steps in Louisiana. 
Um, and, and that's consistent with, with the other part of that. God will order your steps, but you have to move your feet. Uh, we have been doing that. At the end of last week, we announced that for the sixth month in a row, we've broken our own unemployment record with non-seasonally adjusted unemployment at 2.9%. Seasonally adjusted remained at 3.3%. That's quite impressive as it is, but I think it's even more impressive when you think where we were two years ago, um, a little less than two years ago, at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in December of 2020, our non-seasonally adjusted uh, unemployment rate was 6.9% and seasonally adjusted at 7.2%. So this is a massive decline in just a couple of years. Every job lost during the pandemic, uh, I'm sorry, during the pandemic has been recaptured and then some. Uh, we've added 228,000 jobs and we have more Louisianans working today than ever before at more than 2,042,000 employed Louisianans. Another thing I think that we should be uh, proud of and that seemed impossible uh, seven years ago when I became governor has to do with our budget. Uh, this year, we passed a budget that makes historic investments in education at every level, uh, unprecedented amounts of funding for our infrastructure, uh, to include broadband, uh, just to name a few things. Uh, higher education, for example, received the largest state funding increase ever uh, at almost $85 million in state general fund, another $74.3 million in statutorily dedicated funds, but pre-K the new investment exceeded $80 million, incredibly important for us in our future. Uh, Y'all know that uh, K through 12 teachers received a $1,500 pay raise. And after all of that, there was still more than $300 million in recurring revenue that went to one-time expenditures. Contrast that to the situation before I became governor, when every year more and more one-time dollars were spent on recurring expenditures which we haven't done a single time since I've been governor. And as you know, the REC met last week and in the current year recognized $925 million in excess. Uh, and we know that we closed out last year, uh, once all the, the books were balanced and so forth, uh, with a surplus that exceeds $700 million. So you add it all up. Uh, we've gone from about a $2 billion deficit when I became governor to uh, surpluses and excess that together uh, show about $2 billion to the good. That is a huge step forward for our state. We did that by growing and diversifying the economy. Uh, and by making a lot of really uh, strategic decisions, um, all of which will inure to our benefit. Uh, I can tell you that when the 25% of the surplus is put into the rainy day fund, that fund will have more than $900 million in it, which is more than had the day I became governor. And of course, 10% of that will go to the unfunded accrued liability. We have also been paying uh, debt for the state. Uh, and every chance we get, we use the surplus, the one-time money for that, so that we don't then bond out and pay on that debt over decades. So, for example, $400 million, again, uh, for the second installment of that amount, paid for the non-federal share of the hurricane storm damage risk reduction system that benefits parts of five parishes. Uh, that work, as you know, started after Hurricane Katrina. Uh, that's just one example of that. And so we're making progress. And one of the reasons this is incredibly important is because in fiscal year 26, and this is what some people lose sight of, when the 0.45 cents added sales tax goes away and when more of the vehicle sales tax is dedicated to the state transportation trust fund and doesn't flow into the state general fund, there will be more than an $800 million hit to the state general fund. So we need to manage expectations uh, so that people understand what, what's happening in the future, which is why it's really important that we grow, diversify our economy, 
and that we produce this extra uh, revenue. And of course, that'll be an issue for uh, fiscal year 2026, as I mentioned. I also want to highlight some of the other accomplishments uh, that state agencies have achieved. Uh, Louisiana Department of Economic Development uh, secured $14.3 billion in new investments this year, uh, which will create uh, almost 8,000 new jobs in addition to all the jobs that were uh, retained. And these projects uh, happened in all eight economic regions of the state. And much of this is directly attributable uh, to our efforts to grow and diversify the economy through clean energy production and emissions reductions. Uh, and that's a great transition to tout the accomplishments, I think, of the uh, CPRA. The reason these companies are choosing Louisiana are several, one of which we have the most uh, productive manufacturing workforce in the United States of America, uh, as reported by the Census Bureau. Uh, but also because of our proven commitment to clean energy future. As you all know, Louisiana became the only Gulf South, this, Gulf South state this year to have uh, and announce a clean energy plan, a climate action plan, uh, to reach our goal of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Again, the only Gulf South state with that goal. Uh, and at the same time, CPRA completed some of our biggest restoration and dredging projects in history and the investment we're making this year 1.3 billion dollars in coastal restoration protection projects through CPRA using their priorities. Now you, you all know we have a 50 year plan that envisions at least 50 billion dollars. Well we're on track. That's that is the good news and that doesn't uh, include uh, unprecedented amounts of federal funding coming through the Corps of Engineers for various projects like Morganza to the Gulf, New Orleans to Venice, West Shore, uh, and so forth. We are making tremendous progress. Um, in addition, the Department of Natural Resources applied for and was granted $25 million in federal funding for restoring orphan well sites uh, through the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act. And we're going to do that in a way that maximizes uh, the reduction in fugitive emissions of methane. Uh, and in the, on top of that, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, uh, through a CEA, contracted with the um, Department of Natural Resources to uh, spend another $12.7 million to close 151 wells on federal refuges. Um, the DOTD. Uh, has been hard at work uh, this year. Uh, Louisiana is set to receive approximately $1 billion over the course of five years through the Bridge Formula Program as part of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Um, there are over 500 locally owned off-system bridges in Louisiana that are eligible to receive the funding. And we have carved out $270 million for this purpose. And over the next five years, we will replace or repair five times as many off-system bridges as would have otherwise been the case because of this funding that we've allocated for this purpose. And we will work with the local parishes to determine which bridges get repaired, which are most important to them. DOTD also received word in August that our request uh, for reallocation, reallocated uh, federal highway funding was approved. This time it was $97.8 million. The reallocation happens when funding is allocated to other states, but they're not able to obligate all of the funding within the fiscal year. That money is then available to other states, provided that we have, in fact, allocated all of our funding for the previous year, and, and we have. You have to have the projects uh, for the funding, and then you have to have the non-federal match. We were able to uh, successfully get this almost $100 million of additional funding this year, and that brings the total uh, over the time since 2016 to right at $400 million in reallocated uh, highway funding that we've been able to secure. And I think Dr. Sean Wilson has done a tremendous job of positioning our state to do that. Uh, before I leave DOTD, and this really is true for a, a number of infrastructure projects, whether it's CPRA or DOTD, 
One of the great things about having surplus and excess in the current year is you all know that we've, we're going through an inflationary period, and a lot of the projects that we are uh, putting out for bid are coming in well over uh, the amount that we estimated. So in order to move forward with the work uh, that the legislature uh, has agreed uh, to fund, we're going to need to move some of these one-time dollars to existing projects, um, which if we didn't have those one-time dollars, we would be cutting back on the scope of work that we're going to do, and that won't be necessary. Uh, and I think that's, that's a very positive thing as well. With respect to uh, another type of infrastructure, uh, broadband, uh, this has been a banner year for Connect LA, uh, which is our office for broadband development. Connect LA was awarded nearly $170 million through the Gumbo Grant Program uh, to impact more than 80,000 locations. Now, with the private match that comes from the Internet service providers, this is more than $300 million to connect those 80,000 addresses uh, to high-speed Internet that will be affordable. Additionally, Connect LA was the very first program in any state to be awarded um, money from uh, the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act uh, for broadband and digital equity planning uh, funds. Um, and we know that once the FCC's mapping is complete and all the states have an opportunity to weigh in on, on the accuracy of the mapping, Louisiana is set to receive more than $1 billion additional uh, from the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act for broadband. That money, too, will be matched by private Internet service providers, and then we feel very confident we will be able to close the digital divide in Louisiana well before our deadline of 2029. And I want to thank uh, Vanith Iyengar for his work in, uh, at Connect LA. I also want to commend the Department of Health, uh, community partners and healthcare workers for their tireless workers, uh, I'm sorry, tireless work uh, to save lives. Um, I'm towards the end of this set of prepared remarks and haven't talked about COVID yet. And I remember where we were at this time last year. We were going into the Omicron surge, uh, which proved to be the, the steepest surge uh, in the entire pandemic. And in January of this year, uh, just 11 months ago, we had over 3,000 people in the hospital. So think about that. We're obviously doing much better, uh, but that is not to say that our uh, hospitals and other uh, healthcare entities aren't stressed. Uh, because the, the combination of COVID, the flu, and RSV uh, are taxing our health care providers. Um, and so I do want to uh, encourage people uh, to make sure you're staying up to date on your COVID vaccines and boosters. Um, COVID is still here. It's not over. And you all know that typically in, in uh, winter, when people come together indoors, uh, there's an increase uh, in, in COVID. Uh, that will likely happen again this year, but, but we have the tools to protect ourselves. We know who's most vulnerable uh, to the disease as well. Uh, but we're also having uh, one of the worst flu seasons that we've seen in a very long time here in Louisiana and around the country. There are flu shots available uh, for that uh, as well to, to maximize the protection that you have. Um, so it's important that we all do that. I'm going to stop here and and I think take uh, a few questions and then come back and, and close out uh, the press conference with a couple of more remarks. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Well, we're working with the insurance commissioner. We've had a number of conversations uh, with him. Uh, I don't believe we will do a special session, but what we do have the opportunity to do, precisely because we have excess in the current year, when we go into session in April, we can very quickly take up a supplemental appropriation that would move money uh, that is excess current year into the incentive uh, program that was reestablished through legislation last year. And we will spend the time between now and April working with the commissioner and with legislators to determine what that amount of funding should be. Um, but but it, it will be in, in the neighborhood of what the commissioner is asking for. Um, and, and I do think it's something that we need to do. I mean, this is, this is a 
crisis that got worse this year, even though we didn't have a hurricane. And it shows the interconnectedness of the markets uh, because there was uh, actually two hurricanes in Florida. Uh, and many of the insurance companies who are in the market here in Louisiana are also in Florida. So when they get stressed there, uh, sometimes that, that causes them to stop uh, writing in Louisiana as well. Um, it's obviously it's, this is a crisis situation uh, given the, the tremendous increase in the book of business that is uh, being underwritten by uh, citizens, not it's supposed to be an insurer of last resort. So, yeah, we, we're going to have to do something. And so we look forward to working with them. But I don't see a special session to do this, but I think we can take it up early in April uh, and, and get the funding necessary for that incentive program. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, so uh, the REC recognized the additional revenue, which, which uh, is, when you say a billion and a half, so I think it's important to kind of keep those numbers uh, in, their, in their silos. So the uh, Commissioner of Administration will present the executive budget proposal to the legislature in February. Uh, that session where they will take up um, the budget will start in, in April. Uh, but the additional recurring revenue for next year uh, is in the $600 million range. Um, obviously, there are some things that we know we need to do uh, with that um, to increase funding for some state agencies such as DCFS. But we know also uh, we want to continue to invest in education um, with teacher pay and, and so forth. Um, and then it would be my expectation that not all $600 million of additional recurring revenue would be reflect, reflected in the budget um, for uh, recurring expenditures that, like we did last year, some amount of that uh, would be carved out for one time. Uh, I think that that's really important um, as we uh, approach FY26 and make sure that, that we are uh, being very responsible about how, how we get there uh, so that when that uh, Eight hundred million dollar hit to the state general fund comes uh, that that it's something that that we can uh, as a state handle uh, without precipitous funding cuts to essential priorities and and we're certainly well on that path based on what the REC uh, has recognized um, as recently as last week. Yes, ma'am. Well, as you've heard me say before, I do think that there's improvement that needs to be addressed. Um, so I think things have been, I, I, I would say, uh, relatively smooth. Uh, we, we've obviously had some isolated cases where uh, individuals weren't able to access an abortion in state uh, when, when they probably should have, especially given um, the medical futility e exception that we have. Additional work has been done on that uh, by the Department of Health uh, to uh, increase the, the uh, specific conditions uh, which would satisfy the exception and leaving the general catch-all language of the medical futility exception as it is uh, uh, in the, the statute. But you've heard me say this before, and I continue to believe um, that we should have a, a, an exception for rape and incest mm -hmm. as well. Um, so that's something that I hope the legislature and we'll, we'll ask the legislature to put uh, in place in statute in the session that starts in April. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, well, first of all, there, there's enough work to do uh, and we're going to work hard every single day um, over the course of the next uh, Twelve and a half months, or whatever it is that, that I have left, um, and really want to make sure that that uh, when we leave, uh, that we leave it better than we found it. And the same thing that your your first grade teacher taught you, or your mom and dad taught you as a little kid, um, and that that should play out, uh, especially as it relates to the fiscal situation in the state. Um, when you when you think back to just how bad it was, uh, the 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 day that I became governor, there was 
over $800 million of one-time money in the budget for recurring expenditures. And we had already cut higher education more than any other state in the nation over the previous years. We weren't funding anything that was a priority as if it was a priority. Uh, and it took an awful lot of hard work to be able to turn that around um, and, and work with, with the legislature um, that, that has proven to be successful. And so it's obviously critically important. But the reason I ran for governor was to increase funding for education. It really is the key uh, to solving ills that have plagued our state for far too long in a number of areas, whether it's um, breaking cycles of intergenerational poverty in families and communities, whether it's improving um, uh, the uh, crime rate or the, the amount of people that have to be incarcerated. It is directly related to improving health outcomes and everything else. Cre you create prosperity, you create wealth, you create opportunity through a better educated citizenry, uh, and, and therefore uh, investments in education are critically important. And we have turned the corner on that with record investments in early childhood. And, and by the way, I've said this before, there is nothing more important for our state long term uh, than investing in early childhood education. Uh, so that more of our kids show up to school ready to learn. And we have to maintain these investments for at least a generation. And when we do that, we're going to see transformation uh, at a level that, that we've only dreamed of. I, I really believe that. But we have started that. And, and so being able to continue that and hand that off uh, to the next legislature, to the next governor, whoever he or she would be, is among my highest priorities. And, and clearly, we have unprecedented opportunities to invest in infrastructure in Louisiana, too, uh, both because it is a priority for us uh, and, and we have uh, the, the surplus money uh, that, as you know, has to be spent on, on one-time expenditures like uh, transportation infrastructure, like coastal restoration and protection, for example, uh, and the capital outlay program to include deferred maintenance uh, and improvements on our college campuses. Uh, so all, all of that's going to be critically important. And then you layer on top of that opportunities we have through the bipartisan infrastructure law. And now the Inflation Reduction Act is going to be very helpful as well. And I just think we have tremendous opportunities to invest in, in infrastructure too uh, that will, that will um, make our state a better place to, to live and to invest and to, to, uh, to work and all of those things. So, and, and so all of that's very important, and, and we, we certainly are going to be moving forward on all of those fronts and many more over the coming year. Yes, sir. Governor, you said willing to meet with the Legislative Committee on the Ronald Green issue, and have there been any discussions on trying to make that happen? Not to my knowledge. You know, I was scheduled uh, to go, and the, um, the committee rescinded the invitation or, or – whatever, I don't know if they canceled that meeting or whatever. Um, then there was a subsequent meeting that had been scheduled for, for quite a while, and a few days before it, they invited me. Um, I had a schedule full of events, but I, as I told them then, I'm perfectly happy to, to sit down and speak with them. I can't imagine they have a question that I haven't already answered, uh, because I've addressed every question that's been put to me um, and, and have been asked, I think, about this at least twice about every every single aspect of it as, as best I can tell. Yes. The I'm coming over here next. I'm sorry. Yeah, was, you were in the back. I'm, I'm coming back this way. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No. Uh, look, as I have said from the very beginning, um, that when, when this was uh, um, obviously became public and, and so forth, that I believe there was criminal conduct in the manner in which the state police took Mr. Green into custody uh, subsequent to the motor vehicle accident. I think, uh, by and large, uh, the indictments reflect that. Um, and so I, I don't know of anything else that I would add at this point. Yes? Yeah. Which, as you know, has become controversial, both mm -hmm. effectiveness and potential risk downside. Do you think 
Yeah, no, I, I don't. Um, and, and I think the science is sound. I think uh, carbon capture utilization and storage is safe. Um, and it's safer here in Louisiana uh, than anywhere else because we have the geologic formations here in a high number that will permanently sequester uh, the, the CO2 in a very safe way. But I do know that we have to do more, both as a state, uh, working primarily through uh, DNR, but primarily the private companies looking to invest in this area uh, to to um, talk to people in the communities about carbon capture and about the science and about the safety and and how the uh, integrity of these formations is ascertained in advance um, so that they know that, that this is safe. Look, car uh, carbon capture is a huge part, not just of our state climate action plan, um, but it's, it's very important for the country and for the world. Uh, and we are going to transition away from fossil fuels and, and they, will, they will be consumed in, in smaller and smaller amounts as we move forward over the coming years and decades. Um, but we can't flip a switch today and get off of fossil fuels and, and therefore if we want to achieve our carbon reductions, carbon capture is going to, going to be an integral part of that. Um, and quite frankly, we, we can't achieve our goals here in Louisiana. The country can't achieve its goals without uh, carbon capture. Uh, and, and this is happening elsewhere in the world too, not, not just here, but, but around the world. Um, and so it is something that I believe in, um, but I know that we have more work to do um, in, uh, in, in educating people, uh, listening to them, answering their questions and, and so forth. Yes, ma'am. All right, so just to make sure, child sex trafficking is, is, is uh, that may not be what you were asking, but obviously we know that, that around the world here in the country and in our state, uh, we have human sex trafficking that includes children. That is a real concern of mine and of all law enforcement, all state agencies and so forth, and that's something we have to do to educate people about to prevent uh, as much as we can. And, but now if your question is about the, the uh, availability in our school libraries and other libraries of reading materials, it, and, and I, don't, I don't really, is that what you're asking about? Um, I believe the tip line was to address both obscene materials and the possibility of child yeah. sex. Yeah, so, so I, I mean, I don't know what sort of tips he's getting. Um, it, anything that we can do, uh, I think, to uh, alert officials to human sex trafficking involving children is incredibly important. You know, I go all over the state all the time and I speak to people. Uh, I've never had a, a parent tell me personally that they're concerned about what books are or are not in their libraries and, and so forth. Uh, again, I don't know what sort of tips the, the Attorney General might be getting there. Uh, that It seems to me to be uh, part of a, a national movement or a narrative that is developing out there, and, and I'm not sure that it's a it's a real problem. I guess it's a perceived problem for some. Last question. At a minimum. Yes. Do you have any thoughts about the legislative effort to repeal the income taxes? Well, uh, first of all, I have a lot of thoughts about it. Uh, we we have had a number of expert groups formed. Um, over the years to look at our tax system and to make recommendations for what uh, it should look like, what changes need to be made. Um, and that, that uh, group was last convened um, back in the 2016-2017 time period, did not recommend ending uh, the income tax either on individuals or corporations, did recommend doing what we have done, uh, and that is to get rid of deductions that no other state has uh, in turn for lowering rates. Um, and, and so that was a tax reform that was recommended by uh, the group. Now, 
there's nothing about the income tax that that I believe means that we absolutely have to keep it at all costs. The the challenge I have is that many of the people talk about uh, getting rid of the income tax. They're not talking about the funding necessary to replace it. We already have one of the lowest tax states in the nation, um, and and so if we want to if we want to um, have the health care system that we need, if we want to invest in education, if we want to continue to make progress on a number of fronts, you, you, you've got to have the revenue. Um, you know, people are celebrating the investments we're making, and I remind people all the time, you cannot invest what you do not have. And so if, some, if someone out there is advocating for getting rid of the income tax, um, okay, what's the second part of that? How are you going to replace the revenue? And a lot of times these people will point to a specific state, and maybe the state of Texas, because it is uh, contiguous to us, and say, well, Texas doesn't have an income tax. But then you point out all the things that they do that we don't do here when it comes to uh, getting revenue, and, and the people say, well, we're not interested in that. Well, I mean, we, we, we have to have a realistic, balanced uh, approach to this. Um, I, I can tell you I don't believe that there will be a, a successful effort in the upcoming legislative session to eliminate the income tax. Um, I think that maybe, maybe some people who won't explore that option in the sense of having starting the conversation uh, to see what can be agreed upon and, and so forth going forward, I don't believe that that's going to happen this year uh, because I, I don't see the balanced approach to it. Okay, so with all of that, I want to thank you again for uh, being here today and for your hard work uh, over the, this past year covering issues that are important to the people of our state. Um, I will have my monthly radio show uh, on Wednesday uh, afternoon between 2 and, and 3 o'clock. Um, and then I'm hoping for a quiet couple of weeks, just like you all probably are. Uh, so that we can we can enjoy the holidays uh, with our families and and so forth, and then come back uh, rejuvenated uh, early next year. And then and then I'm I'm hoping and praying that everyone will have the best, most blessed and merry Christmas ever, happy Hanukkah, and and, um, and then 2023 for all of us and for your families will be the best year ever. And to try to get it started on the right front as you leave, uh, I want to make sure that you help yourself to the Governor's Mansion chocolate chip cookies uh, that have been made available to you. Thank you all and God bless.